schedule here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get going. Just grab your last uh, glass of water. So I, I wanted to um, give you guys a break, but I also want to give you a chance to ask any questions that you had about, uh, about the TA program and the general MAP21 stuff before I go on to the next programs. Uh, I got one question about how uh, performance measures impact uh, the money that the state spends if they haven't been written yet and the state's already spending their, their fiscal year uh, 2014 dollars. And uh, that's a good question. And, um, and the answer is that this is where I, I made passing reference to MAP 21 being a two-year bill, but some of its clauses relating to far out. So, the, so theoretically, there are penalties that the state can, uh, can receive from, from the feds for not meeting their performance targets. Um, so the idea is you set your targets and you need, to, you need to show progress towards your targets. And then about seven years out, there can start to be some, some repercussions uh, for not meeting those targets. So it's really a long-term uh, thing trying to get uh, this idea of a, of a return on, on your investments in terms of safety, in terms of congestion, in terms of uh, road condition, and, and so forth. So, um, the immediate impact, the rules haven't even been set yet. Once they get set, states will set their goals, regions will set their goals, and then they'll start to have to uh, issue reports based on their progress, and then there will be some, there could be uh, uh, some impact on the funding, uh, namely that funding would be targeted towards improving those things, and, and they'd lose some flexibility if they weren't making progress towards their goals. So. Um, any other questions on, did, first of all, did, did that answer your question? Okay. Um, any other questions on the morning or the first piece? Okay. Awesome. So I want to talk about some of the specific uh, other programs. So this idea of, you know, um, Bruce mentioned the $10 million not, not going far enough for the $16 million. Um, and so where are the other places that we can look? And this has really been the core of, of our advocacy advance program from the beginning. The idea that the real, the real money, you know, we're, we're a legitimate you know, transportation uh, area, walking and biking. And so we should be competing for the real dollars. And so these are some of the funding sources that we're going to talk about. What I'll do is, is I'll give a little bit of a description of the program, uh, and then I'll talk about what uh, or excuse me, I'll give a little bit of history of federal spending on biking and walking. I'll give some general strategies uh, for what agencies have done to give good what, biking and walking projects a really good competitive chance of getting funded. And then I'll go through the individual programs and talk about what's eligible in them, uh, what changed in MAP 21, and give some examples of what advocates have done, what agency staff have done, and what, and what elected officials have done to really uh, elevate biking and walking within these programs and, and make them more competitive for these dollars. So uh, this is a, a chart of federal dollars spent on bicycling and walking spent by the states. Um, sometimes the idea of calling them federal dollars can be misleading because it's actually the states and the regions that spend these dollars. Um, and, and you can see steady growth over time. Without reading the legend, can anybody tell me what this is? <laughs> All right, yes. Stimulus, yes. So one of the lessons from this chart is you never know uh, what your opportunities are going to be. And so in 2009, Congress wrote the, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the Stimulus Act, and turned to DOTs and said, OK, you need to spend uh, transportation dollars uh, as, as quickly as possible, the concept of shovel ready, right? It's kind of this term that got thrown around a lot. And it turns out that if you ask states to look at their project lists and see what's been planned, and some preliminary fu funding has gone into the planning but hasn't been built yet, 
lot of those projects are bicycling and walking projects. So we saw this huge spike. It was the first time uh, in one year that the U.S. spent more than a billion dollars on biking and walking projects. Uh, and it was because agencies had those plans ready to go. So that's, you know, an important lesson from that is, is always having a, a couple plans. You don't necessarily know where the money's coming from, but you don't know what the opportunities. I'm not predicting, predicting another stimulus bill, um, but you never know, right? So the other question is what, anyone know what these little dips are when they, what was happening during those years? No, neither of those are R words. Maybe a different R word. Reauthorization. So this is when the transportation bill was being debated. Uh, and, and DOTs didn't necessarily know what the fate of the biking and walking programs were going to be. And so they kind of slowed their planning. And um, that's something that we want to make sure that we're really aggressive about. And as MAP21 gets debated again, we still go forward. Uh, John already mentioned the uncertainty of 2015. We want to make sure that, that we're still committed to, to active transportation. Um, beyond the fate of, of TA, for example. So um, this is that same money over that same period of time and by program. So typically when people look at this chart, they have one of two reactions. They either see this big blue piece, and that's transportation enhancements, and they say, wow, that's, I can't believe it all came from TE. Or they say, wow, I, I didn't know anything else was used. And so you know, we have CMAC in here. We have um, uh, general STP in here, um, 10 and 8% of all bike ped funding came from those two programs. So the point is, a lot of these other programs are being used already, and so we're going we're gonna to talk about some best practices there. And then we see, you know, we see this increase in spending, and we see, you know, a similar in increase in bike commuting. And so, in among the um, 70 largest U.S. cities, those that are considered bicycle friendly communities by the League of American Bicyclists. Um, if, if we had updated this for 2011, you'd see an 80% growth since 2000 in bicycle friendly communities. And then you see in non-bicycle friendly communities pretty much tracks with the national average. So communities that make investments in bikes and walking spend these dollars, they see a growth in uh, in bike commuting, and so it really does pay off. If you build it, they will come. So how do people set the rules for these other funding programs so that biking and walking can really compete? So what I'm going to talk about is mostly systems, not individual projects. We'll talk a little bit about that. But how do we set up the rules so that they work well for biking and walking? And the key thing here to, is to understand uh, who, who makes the rules. Who makes the project selections? What the criteria are? What level of government we're talking about? Are these federal rules, state rules, regional rules? And, um, and when uh, are the decisions made? Because if you miss a selection cycle, you can be waiting for one, two, three years before your chance comes back again. So knowing the answers to those questions are going to be really critical. And that's what the funding profile really does. So um, thank you, Hampton Rhodes, for doing that. Um, and then we're really we're talking about programming decisions. How does this prioritization that one, the, one of the mayors talked about this morning, this, this prioritization process, how does this work and how does that impact what gets picked? Now, this is the most boring slide I could find to describe the planning process, but uh, we were in um, Arkansas the other day and a planner raised his hand and said, I love this slide, it's so important, people forget how important planning is. Um, and it really is critical. So in order to be eligible for federal funds, your project has to be involved in the planning process. So um, you all got a copy of the long range plan. That's that really beautiful black document. Um, biking and walking, active transportation, either has to be identified as a goal in the long range plan, or in some long range plans, they actually identify specific projects. And so you, you need to get your project sort of to fit uh, into the goals of your long-range plan. And so the projects get picked have to be consistent with the long-range plan. And then from that, you go through this prioritization project, and your projects get selected to be on the Transportation Improvement Program. And that's that single sheet of paper uh, that has the, the, oh, is that the whole thing? And Ken has a copy of the, it's a tip. It's the whole tip. Oh, OK, great. Great. 
Excellent, perfect. So Ken has a copy of that. You can browse. Um, so once you get put on the, the tip, uh, then, and by, to get put on the tip, you have to have money attached to it. They have to understand where the funds are going to come from. It's not just a wish list. And then the implementation happens. So this is the process, linking planning all the way through. Um, and you need to be on, on, on local plans. Somebody mentioned uh, a, a greenway plan, I think. Um, that's really critical um, to, be, to be involved all the way through this process. So um, in the afternoon, uh, Jeff will talk about policies and guidance that'll, that'll be integrated into your transportation process that, that'll help biking and walking. But really understanding what's on the application, what we talked a little bit in the morning about the points awarded to trail connectivity and so forth, what's being valued here, uh, and, and how are things being weighted within the application. And then who's on your committee? So most of these programs involve some sort of decision-making committee. Who's, who's at the table there? Is there a representative for bicycling and walking and, and safety and transit uh, in that decision-making process? And then really importantly is the political support. I mean, the fact that we had two mayors from the region here this morning, like that many of you are, are here with the blessing of, of your elected officials and your bosses is really, really important because this really boils down to priority. What choices are we going to make? Um, so the money is there, um, but it's, it, there's competition for it all. So what, what's the political support like? Um, and then we talk about focus on safety because really no one is against safety. So if your project um, you know, improves non-motorized safety, that's going to be an important angle, an important aspect to emphasize. And finally, building partnerships. Um, every, every successful project has a whole network of people supporting it and working together. And, and I think there's a lot of opportunities for those partnerships in the room today. Just a few things. I looked, I looked at what regions in the country spent the, the most of their, uh, some of their discretionary, some of their CMAQ dollars and the STP dollars on biking and walking by percentage. And I called them up. I said, why were you guys so successful? And these are some of the answers that we got. In California and Illinois, they actually devolved decision-making process you know, down to the local level. And sometimes we think that neighborhoods really get biking and walking. Cities really get biking and walking. Regions get biking and walking. And then you get to the state level and it can be a lot about moving cars and so forth. So devolving that decision making down um, can be really helpful, we've found. Chicago uh, compares projects by type. So for CMAC, they say we're going to set aside the proportion of CMAC dollars to the proportion of applications for bike ped we get. And then we're going to let the best bike ped projects um, get funded, so we're comparing bike ped to bike ped, instead of comparing biking and walking to diesel retrofit projects, which should be really hard to compare the benefits of the two projects together. Seattle just says, let's make things simple, 10% of all of our surface transportation and CMAC dollars have to go to non-motorized projects, period. Guys in Chicago say don't do that, because what if you want to spend more than 10%? Seems like a psychological barrier to doing that. But I, I think that would be a great step for most communities at this point. And then Milwaukee didn't do any of those things. They didn't have any policy requiring non-motorized spending. They just said, we do it through our planning process. So we make sure that every one of our plans, whether it's a, a utilities plan, a greenway plan, a, a general transportation master plan, a bike ped master plan, um, they all include really good biking and walking projects. So anytime you're looking at a, at a corridor, there's a bike ped project plan for that corridor already. It's already in the planning process, so we just automatically include it because it's there. And the other thing they do, which I think is really good advice, is they say we work with our local advocates to work with uh, local applicants to make sure that they're getting good applications. We sometimes hear, it blows my mind, but we sometimes hear we just don't get good applications. We'd be happy to um, spend this money we just need good applications. So they work with advocates to make sure that they're generating those really high quality applications. And that's, that's something I think a lot of us in the room can collaborate on. So those are some general, general uh, pointers. And I just want to go through uh, each of the programs. So STP. This is a lot of agencies' favorite uh, funding source because it's really flexible. And you can build, um, I used to have to say, bicycle transportation facilities and transportation walkways. Now uh, that any TA activity is eligible for the surface transportation program, 
that includes recreational trails programs. So now you can actually use STP dollars for projects that don't have a purely transportation uh, use. Um, you can do non-construction projects related to safe uh, bicycling use. So you can do uh, uh, you can do workshops like this. Bike maps have been funded and so forth. And typically, there's an 80% federal share, so the region or the locality has to come up with a 20% local match. So what did MAP21 change in the surface transportation program? Well, they increased, they increased funding somewhat, but they also increased competition. So now, STP has to fund some non-highway bridges that they didn't before. So there's definitely more competition for it, but it's still uh, a, a really uh, good source of funds in terms of eligibility, any, any TA activity, rec trails, um, safe routes to school isn't listed, but um, safe routes for non-drivers are. So there's a lot of flexibility with STP, and we'll just look at a few examples of that. Um, this is one that I love. In Peoria, Illinois, back 2006, they didn't really have a quantitative way to do it. They basically looked at the projects, and they kind of did some horse trading. I'll, I'll, I'll vote for your project if you vote for mine. And um, the local FHWA district office said, you know what, you guys should really come up with a way to make your application and award points for different things. It's that prioritization we talked about. And I think, I think the suggestion actually came from FHWA that they award some points for non-motorized project components. So the MPO said, that sounds good to me. We like non-motorized stuff. We'll do that. And they turned to the League of Illinois Bicyclists and said, hey, Ed Barsati, executive director, what should we give points for, right? So when you have your application, we're going to give 10 points for non-motorized pieces, but what should we award points for? So Ed said something along the lines of two points for sidewalks on both sides, parallel uh, trails, two points for that, parallel bike lanes, two points for that, uh, pedestrian lighting, crosswalk, signalization, things like that. And so they came together with a package of recommendations and the MPO made some tweaks and basically accepted it. And so what happened was overnight, they went from getting most of their STP applications um, not including any sidewalks, any bike lanes, anything like that. The next year, the vast majority of the projects included those things. And the reason for that is that the folks competing for these funds are really bright and they understand that if they don't include the non-motorized piece, the most points they're going to get is 90%. And someone else is going to include some sidewalks and some lighting and some bike lanes and trails, and they're going to get funded over us because they got um, up to 100 points. And so um, I think it's a really great example because the outcome is so good. It shows what tweaking an application can do, but it also shows that collaboration between uh, really FHWA, the local MPO staff, and uh, the biking and walking advocates. Yeah. Yes, sir. So Yeah. It's not a separate process. Yeah. yeah. So just get in your um, regional planning All right, great. And we'll and we'll hear the, the regional specifics for sure. Um, just trying to give some some examples of um, of how this is done at some places that have worked really well. Um, so in Nashville um, and this is this is sort of similar to that where they didn't have a separate a a STP and uh, TA process, but they tie their funding to their long-range plan. And so what they did is they did a, a public survey and they asked folks what their transportation priorities were and what the region's goals should be. And what came back was huge support for uh, transportation investments that would result in health improvements. Because down, down in Nashville, um, obesity is a, a significant issue. So that came back as the number one uh, priority that they wanted the, uh, the transportation plan to take into account. So what that did is that led them directly to thinking about uh, walking and biking and transit, because you know you always have, you have to access transit somehow, and that improves physical activity. So they tied their long-range plan to um, specific funding goals that would set aside 15% uh, of the funds, up to 25% of the funds if you include transit, for biking, walking, and transit. Uh, right off the top to connect to their long-range plan goals using STP dollars 
um, and some CMAC dollars and, and TE and TA as well. Um, so starting again, starting with those planning goals and connecting your, uh, your funding decisions uh, to those goals can be really good for, for biking and walking. Uh, another cool use of STP dollars is um, down in Atlanta, and this is a, this is a story that, that the Atlanta NPO loves because it won them so much goodwill uh, from, from the cities under their jurisdiction. They took their STP funds and said, if you want to apply to be a livable centers community, we will give you funding to put together uh, a whole set of planning documents from land use to transportation, and then we will give you um, a portion of $500 million from STP uh, to put your plans into place. And the reason that was so uh, good is they really had to meet land, they had to meet air quality standards. So again, Atlanta. So the lesson here is Nashville is all about health, so they tied their planning uh, to health and got really good active transportation outcomes. Atlanta is all about air quality, so they tied their plan to air quality and got really good biking and walking outcomes. By, by saying that you could apply to become a, uh, a, a active, uh, what was it called? Um, a livable centers community um, to put together these plans, it generated a tremendous amount of goodwill uh, among these communities in the Atlanta region and then allowed the MPO to do some other things that they want to do because they had that, that goodwill that they might otherwise have gotten pushed back for. Um, some of the lessons that they recommended from, from their experience was really don't underestimate investments in planning. Uh, once you have those, um, those projects ready, it's a little easier to, pr to program the funding, and I know that's something that, that this area has, has done pretty well on. Um, and they're using the STP dollars really allowed them to be really flexible. The kinds of um, planning documents that they could fund were more flexible uh, than if they were using uh, other funding sources. So they could do land use and they could do um, some other kinds of things. So um, that's STP. And again, the way it works in every state and region is, is different. And so we'll hear the specifics in a minute. And I've, I've already seen uh, the Hampton Roads uh, slides and they're excellent on giving the, the specifics of the way the program works here. So uh, the CMEC program, this is, this is one that um, I know, uh, I think it was the Williamsburg mayor uh, mentioned that, that um, they've tapped into, which is excellent. Uh, this is called the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program. And it basically funds projects only in areas uh, that have not met federal air quality standards. And so um, each state has to designate its, its non-attainment areas. And then within that, CMAC can be used for uh, non-recreation, bicycle, transportation, pedestrian improvements that provide a reduction in single occupancy vehicle travel. 80% um, federal share, typically. And we've seen uh, some good stuff. Capital Bike Share was funded initially through uh, CMAC. A big uh, McDonald's uh, Millennium Park Cycling Center in, in Chicago, and then smaller projects like uh, like Sacramento just spent just bought like 10,000 bike racks using using CMAC dollars and put them all over the city. And you could also do non-construction things with it, like bike maps, bike plans, um, a bike fleet for your city employees, a uh, bike ambassador program, um, and and in fact bicycle education. And one of the things that the law says is uh, CMAC can fund any project or program that shifts traffic demand to other modes. So this kind of opens the window for some, perhaps some of the education type program stuff uh, if you can tie that to shifting um, modes to biking and walking. Some of the other trends that are interesting about CMAC and MAP21 is this um, idea of accountability. Um, so you have to do a cost-benefit assessment, um, and then you have to report on the health impacts of your project. So again, they're tying in health to, uh, to their congestion mitigation and air quality piece, um, which is really cool, and I think it's also kind of a trend of where we're, we're seeing things go. Um, quick story of, of how uh, advocates and agency staff have collaborated to increase spending on on uh, biking and walking using CMAC dollars. This has become sort of one of the 
really famous stories in advocacy circles over the last couple of years. Uh, Bike Delaware noticed that in the entire history of the CMAC program, no projects had ever been uh, bike pit projects. There had been no money spent on, on, on specifically biking. There had been a small sidewalk project one time. And, um, and so what they did was they looked at the current list of CMAC projects that, that the region had um, sort of decided on they were going to take a vote on. They noticed that there was this facility that was going to be like a bus parking for, at the Department of Motor Vehicles. And they said, how does that eliminate congestion? How does that improve air quality? And they started, they just asked the question. Um, and the chairman of the committee said, you know what? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, and then there was some discussion about that. And so at the same time, they were talking to, Bike Delaware was talking to the General Assembly about the need for active transportation investments. And they wanted to ask the Assembly to pass a law that would say the DOT was required to spend, uh, they said with $5 million on biking and walking. And the General Assembly said, you know what, DOT is not on board with that. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna require them to do anything. But we'll pass a resolution that says we support a five to $10 million investment in bicycling and walking. And so Bike Dealer said, that, that sounds good to us. Um, they had been working with some lobbyists actually from the health uh, community. They got that language ironed out and they passed that resolution. The following uh, months, the governor had to put together his budget uh, for transportation and he, sure enough, included a $5 million line item uh, for, for a walking, uh, walking, walk, walkable and bikeable Delaware. That was, the, that was the line item. And it was to create a trail network across the state. And so once that funding became available, all of a sudden the CMAC committee, and again, this was a specific committee for CMAC, uh, funding bike ped became a lot more appealing because they knew they could leverage this $5 million in state dollars. Again, you know, 20% local match using that $5 million. Um, you know, you multiply it by, by four, um, and that's your federal dollars. So basically what happened was, and I don't know if I should say this, but uh, James from Bike Delaware pick, called me, picked up the phone, he called me and said, look, the guys on the CMAC committee want me to fill out the application for them. He said, I don't know how to do that. So we did it together. We just sat there on the phone. We filled out the project application. We said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be this many miles. It's going to provide the opportunity for this many people. Um, and, uh, and then he sort of gave it to the chair of the committee. And the chair submitted it. So, um, so that's good. Um, so basically, that's, that's what happened. They, they cracked into CMAC. And then once they had done it once, uh, it, it really opened the floodgates, and, and I mean, six million doesn't maybe seem like a lot of money, but we're talking about Delaware here. They actually ended up with the highest per capita bike ped spending of any state, and 70% of the CMAC dollars are now going to bike ped projects. So, um, you know, some of the lessons there were, you know, look, look at some of your competition too, you know, because they're looking at you. Um, so see, see what else is being funded and see if maybe you don't have a better case than some of those. Secure that match, because once you have that local match, um, your project becomes really much more appealing as opposed to applying and then saying, I'm going to come up with the dollars later. The support of the elected officials was really, really important. That started in the General Assembly. They got the support of, of one of the, uh, the more senior members, um, conservative, conservative guy, but just took the issue to heart, took it seriously, and lent his political support to it, and then it went all the way up to the governor, um, who has since appointed a really, uh, a really first class um, transportation secretary. So they would have a bill of support, and then they worked, again, they worked with the CMAC uh, chair, um, and so there's really good uh, agency uh, advocacy coordination there. Yes, sir? How much uh, federal funding <clears throat> is there for CMAC a year, and is it part of transportation, or is it environmental Good question. So it's it's a federal aid highway program, so it's it's under the transportation um, department, and there is about uh, there's about twice as much money in CMAC as in 
you know, all the bike ped programs, TA, Safe Routes, and Rec Trails combined. So it's a, it's a larger pot. Um, I don't have the regional allocation uh, for you, but it's probably the, the fourth or fifth largest um, funding program of, of, of seven or eight. So it's kind of a mid-range program, um, and it's getting it's targeted in those um, air quality areas. So it, it can be uh, a really good one, and it's, well, I don't want to go all the way back, but it made up about 10% of the bike ped funding uh, that we've seen over the last 20 years. Any other questions on that? Um, I just wanted to address something real quick. Um, and this is kind of a good and a bad problem. But I was told that Hampton Roads may soon mm. no longer be a non-attainment area. So what, I guess, what are strategies moving forward when we lose access to those CMAC funds, which is a good problem. To yes, that's right, yeah. Um, but you know, it's, again, that double-edged sword. What are some strategies to, you know, because you said that's a sizable chunk of funding. Yeah. You know, so it, it depends on what your status ends up being. Uh, if you go from non-attainment, you can go to uh, be considered uh, a maintenance area, meaning that you have achieved attainment, but you're maintaining attainment. And you're still, you're still eligible as a maintenance area for CMAC, but I don't know your maintenance already. And is the fear that you're going to lose that status? OK, so um, are you going to be able to talk about that, or do you want to talk about it now? Okay. So we'll probably, have a, a, I, I don't, I don't want to speculate um, uh, on that, but there has been talk of, of, the, of the new standards for a while, and, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. But I'll, I'd rather have the, the CMAC folks here uh, answer that d definitively. Um, but if, and I don't suppose this would be the case in Virginia, but in the event that there are no non-attainment areas in the state, then CMAC basically gets flexed to STP. But I, I'm sure there'll be other non ask, you know, If we reach the point where all the non attainment yeah. areas are gone, what happens? You still get the money, but it, you can use it for any STP type. The state can use it anywhere in the state for any STP type activity. Okay. So, um, so safety. So sa safety is something that has really come on uh, as an issue. I mentioned um, talking about performance measures how uh, pedestrian fatalities are going up, bicycle fatalities are going up. Um, and, and this is one that really Congress takes very seriously. And so uh, HSIP, the Highway Safety Improvement Program, was one of the programs that really, really increased in size. It, it almost doubled in size overall. Um, so this is just a quick chart that shows, this. here's Virginia here. Uh, so this is um, percent of trips to work by bike, and this is uh, the number of fatalities per 10,000 bicyclists. And so um, you know you really don't want to be here with high fatalities and low ridership. Um, you kind of want to be here with low fatalities and high ridership. Um, Virginia is somewhere in the middle. So the Highway Safety Improvement Program is for safety infrastructure. So if you're talking about uh, uh, intersection improvement, a corridor improvement, we're talking about the built environment here. It's kind of a misnomer, highway safety, uh, because all public roads are eligible for uh, HSIP dollars, so any, any publicly owned roads, because safety is important everywhere, not just, not just on, on highways. HSIP dollars can be used for things like bike lanes, shoulders, uh, again, lighting. Um, uh, one thing I think is really important is trail, trail and road intersections, um, and and signage that came up this morning. I think the th the key thing to know about HSIP, if you're trying to go after these dollars, which which I do recommend, is that it's data driven. You really need to be able to show that your project is going to reduce fatalities and improve safety. And we'll talk we'll talk about Virginia map. Uh, it's really a ninety percent share, so. Again, they want to encourage use of safety dollars. Uh, the feds cover 90% leave 10% local match, typically. Um, what does MAP21 uh, do? Well, they, they increased uh, HSIP funds overall by 88%, almost doubling it. Um, you can use HSIP in, uh, for bike head safety in school zones. And um, they require 
that a state non-motorized representative sits on the committee that writes the strategic highway safety plan, and that's the plan that dictates the prior priorities of the state. And so uh, this was actually included by a member of Congress's staff. We didn't even ask for it. It was a great idea. Um, but they put it in requiring that a representative from the state uh, serves as a capacity of a non-motorized representative. Um, and the committee may also include reps from, from state safety groups as well. So talked about um, it being a data-driven program. And, th and that's, that's something I really admire about the program. They really tie the spending uh, to what impacts you can have. But it can be a challenge for, for bicycling and walking uh, to show the areas uh, that are at uh, greatest risk. Because sometimes the, the uh, fatalities can be more dispersed than, than car fatalities. And so this is a Transportation for America, a, a really great uh, transportation policy group put together this database of pedestrian fatalities. We didn't, they didn't include uh, bicycling fatalities uh, in it, partly because we sort of didn't want to promote the risk of, of bicycling. We didn't want to sort of uh, make people feel like it was super dangerous. Um, but on the pedestrian piece, um, they laid out every pedestrian fatality between 2001 and 2009. Um, and so I just grabbed sort of the, the Chesapeake region to show. If you look at this, you can kind of look at some corridors and say, gosh, what's going on here? Um, what are the speeds like? Are there, are there safe crossing areas? What's going on here? Um, and so having this data in front of you can, can be sort of a, a really helpful tool to figure out where we should be prioritizing our investments. Now, Virginia. Uh, has, had a, has had a DOT policy to set 10% um, of their HSIP aside uh, for bicycling and walking. And I, I really like how that came about. Uh, it was basically a, um, a uh, city, uh, state assemblywoman uh, up in uh, Arlington, which is sort of Northern Virginia, very walkable community. She recognized that 10% of bicycling and walking fatalities were um, non-motorized, people on foot, people on bike, and that no, basically no HSIP dollars were going uh, to, to help safety for those people. And she really saw those as her constituents. And so she proposed a, a bill that would uh, require that. And um, my understanding is that DOT said, you know what, don't, don't pass the bill, don't tie our hands, but we will set that policy. And so they, they have. And, and Virginia's been one of the better states at spending safety dollars um, over the past several years, I have to say. Um, but we have other communities that are, that are also getting more aggressive about it. I mentioned Washington State earlier. When they saw that Safe Rest of School was potentially going to get squeezed, their concern specifically was that it had been a state-run program, and as it gets uh, run at the local level, would, would Safe Routes kind of lose out because the, um, the staff there weren't as familiar with it. And so what they did is they, um, they realized that that HSIP didn't have a history in Washington State for being used for biking and walking. And so they talked to the governor. The governor set aside a committee uh, to figure out how to spend these dollars, and they excluded uh, biking groups. So the Bicycle Alliance for Washington put together a petition, emailed their members, and started kind of uh, raising the profile of this issue. And they got the attention of the governor um, and the committee, and so they were able to, they actually ended up forging a really good working relationship with that committee. And they worked on a deal. And the deal was um, they wouldn't fully fund safe routes at 2009 levels under HSIP. But HSIP would contribute a third of the safe routes dollars. And the other two would come from the Transportation Alternatives Program. And that was seen as a really reasonable deal. The Bicycle Alliance compromised a little bit. The state compromised a little bit. But what it does was it introduced the idea of using state highway safety dollars for uh, walking safety and biking safety. Uh, and opening the door to that is a really important thing, because it's sometimes not in people's, um, in people's minds as, as a priority when looking at the numbers. So some of the lessons here, um, you know, getting the support, getting the attention of the governor and, and the folks making the decisions. Uh, engaging the broader community about the importance of bicycling safety and, and walking safety and, and putting a financial commitment behind that. Um, actually changing the policy. So now there's a, there's a policy that one third of Safe Routes to School budget will be funded through 
uh, the Highway Safety Improvement Program. But again, just to be really flexible and work with folks to come up with a, a solution that works for everybody. And then once you get your foot in the door, as we saw with the CMAC example, uh, that can be the beginning of really good, really good things. Um, so thinking about getting someone on that, getting a, a safety rep on that strategic highway safety plan committee, figuring out how to generate the data, how to look at the data in a way that shows um, the need. So that can be either looking over a longer period of time or looking at a, cor a whole corridor and not just an intersection. Um, and then also finding what your state's other safety goals are and trying to figure out if there's some other things that can be achieved. For example, some states are figuring out that, that speed and speed, speeding contribute to a lot of fatalities. Well, that's lower speeds of cars, really good for bicycle safety. Um, your, chance, your chance of getting killed by getting struck by a car under 25 is, miles per hour is way lower and it increases dramatically as the speeds go up. So they're you know, looking for that, those shared goals so it can maybe not look like it's a bike ped project, maybe it looks like it's a, it's a speeding campaign or, um, uh, or some road diets and things like that, but they can end up having really good benefits for biking and walking. Um, so those are some of the, the H. But any questions on, on H. -SIT before I move on? And we'll, again, we'll hear about it locally. Um, so 402. So we talked about the construction piece, the infrastructure side. 402 is a safety program. So this is where those bicycle education classes can come in for adults that got cut out of um, the transportation alternatives eligibility. Um, one of the neat things about 402 is the money can go directly to advocacy organizations and they can implement the safety programs. But the important thing to remember is it's a reimbursement program. So the advocacy organization has to have the money up front. They run the program, they submit their expenses, and then they get reimbursed. So that can be a challenge for folks um, to raise that money in the first place. One of the things that uh, Bike Texas did is they have this cool program that every time you buy a, a God Bless Texas license plate, um, which they really love Texas down there. So um, they sell a lot of those license plates. Uh, Bike Texas gets, uh, gets the fee that you pay to get that customized license plate. And so um, they're funding their uh, entire bicycle, well, not their entire, but a large portion of their uh, bicycle education program through Share the Road license plates, God Bless Texas license plates, and, and so forth. So that's how they came up with um, the funds to then get reimbursed for, uh, for applying for Section 402 dollars. So they're really working every angle and doing that well. Um, so MAP 21 maintained that uh, adult education is eligible, um, as is you know, general bicycling and walking education. Some examples, I mentioned Bike Texas. Uh, you can do Share the Road campaigns. Uh, you can do Bike School, that became a Safe Routes to School program after they launched it with $402. Florida does helmet distribution. You can do trainings for safety, so you can bring in uh, uh, engineering consultants to talk about um, design guidelines and so forth. The League of American Bicyclists talks about Bike Month, May is Bike Month. Well, you can do a Bike Safety Month event, and NHTSA even does that. They, do, they call May Bike Safety Month. Um, and then I just want to give the example of Bike Walk Connecticut. Um, this, is, this, is an, this is a story that's just really just about having those relationships um, and, uh, and taking advantage of, of knowing who makes the decision. So um, there's a, the woman who was the MPO um, coordinator for the capital region in Hartford, Connecticut. She was literally walking down the hall and she bumped into uh, the person in charge of the 402 program. And I think they literally bumped into each other, which I think is like a pedestrian safety issue, but um, they got started talking about how he was using his safety money, and he was explaining, you know, his hands are really tied, they have to do sort of booze and belts to, you know, uh, drinking and, and safe belt stuff, but he had a little bit of money that he had discretion over. And he was interested in bicycling, I think he was a bicyclist himself. And so uh, he got talking to the, the MPO staff, and she said, well, why don't you 
um, set thirty thousand dollars aside for uh, an education program that will that will run through our MPO. And I mean, literally, he just said okay. Um, so she filled out the paperwork, um, got the got the grant, and they ran the program through the MPO. What makes this a particularly cool story, though, is the MPO staff was an unofficial board member uh, for Bike Walk Connecticut, which is a new statewide advocacy organization. And she said to them, hey, we're going to buy computers. We're going to buy um, outreach material, brochures, and, and produce some education material. That's going to that's going to cost the $30,000. We're going to spend the $30,000. But what we can do is we can give you all that stuff if you promise to continue our education program. And so Bike Walk Connecticut obviously said, yes, please. Uh, and that's what happened. So they, through the MPO, they use this money to go through uh, every fourth grade in Hartford and, and do bike rodeos and teach kids uh, bike safety. And then they took their materials that they had produced for that program. They handed over to Bike Walk Connecticut, and they were able to continue uh, that program taking advantage of the resources without having to go through the, the hoop. So really nice story of all sort of different connections and what that can do. So uh, get to know your staff. Uh, figure out what their needs are and, 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 um, and help find a project that, that benefits both parties. Uh, and again, just that collaboration between agency staff and advocates and, um, and state staff and regional staff. Uh, good things can happen from those molecules bouncing around and, and making contact with each other. So really quickly, uh, we, we uh, got a call one day from um, National Park Service. And some of our friends up there were concerned. There's this brand new uh, federal funding program that no one was really paying attention to. And it was a real opportunity for uh, biking and walking. It's the Federal uh, Lands Access Program, FLAP. Um, and so basically the goal is to increase access to federal lands. Uh, and among eligibility, provisions for pedestrian bicycle written right, right there. I don't think it's actually written in red in the actual law, but I made it bold and red uh, to make the point. So uh, bike ped projects that increase access to federal land are eligible. There's a really big focus on the western states here because that's where most of the federal land is. But uh, Virginia does, is eligible for $3.3 .3 million. And they haven't actually set up their processes yet. So um, if anyone feels like they are, have a project near federal land would be interested in learning more about that, I would encourage you to contact the Eastern Federal Lands Administration uh, at FHWA. And we will provide these slides. But give you a chance to write that down. Um, I just looked up what federal lands, uh, I bet you guys can tell me which of, which of these match up with which of these. So like, what's, what's orange here of these categories? Wildlife, OK. And, and purple? So that's a, I know that's a lot of military down here, right? Uh, green? So fish and, which is fish and wildlife, I think. I don't see it, but you get the idea. Um, these, are the, um, these are the federal lands that are around here. So I threw this up just in case one of you was like, oh, yeah, there would be a great trail to go to connect one of these places. How close does it, does it have to be? It, it has to actually connect to the land. What if, what if, it's, phase, what if it's phase one to get there, but it doesn't quite get there? You probably have a harder case. To be honest. But go back. I mean, look at how many military bases are in this area. I mean, you have tons of roads on all of them. Yeah. And you can use flat to fund bike pet facilities to military bases? Well, it, it, it says federal lands. Um, it. smokes. You know, the priority, the, so the priority is economic generators, and, and, and some of the debate is. What does it mean to be an economic generator? And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, I, I, before, before, before everyone gets too excited, I think it would be unconventional uh, to use it. But, I, but it did occur to me that you guys have, we, we get all the time, uh, the league should do a bicycle-friendly military 
based program uh, because that's so important to so many people. So uh, I think this would be an intriguing, again, this is a new program. It's sort of, a, it's sort of an amalgamation of a couple old programs. And it's the kind of thing that I think a couple phone calls, some questions, it would, it would be really interesting to see what came out of it. So I'm just throwing that out there without making any promises that the, particularly the military bases. But again, access to federal lands. They're federal lands. It needs to be, if I remember the guidance correctly, it needs to be currently owned. I believe, I believe that's the case. Um, that's an, I should write down things. I should double check for you guys. But my understanding is it needs like to be currently owned. We have a big driver transmitter site <clears throat> that's right on uh, yeah. Sleepy Hill Road. And the feds donated that property um, to us. Now, there's a wildlife refuge on the back end. Uh -huh. I think it's a total of about and then it's got water access, and I was just thinking, I got a little excited because we're trying to do a canoe kayak engine into the Nancy River on the point. But if you have to ride through, mm -hmm. through the train. So, I, so I, the honest answer is I don't know, and I don't want, I don't want to give you, say something that's not true, but I can, I can chat, I can look it up, yeah. we'll, we'll be in touch. You want to give me your chat yeah, yeah, yeah. We, have a, we have a report on um, Advocacy Events website on FLAP. And it's got all, all the materials here. Um, so I, again, I, I'm encouraging you just to pick up the phone and, and, and call the regional, um, the Eastern, land, Eastern Federal Lands guy. Um, and just express interest in the program and ask, because uh, we, you know, th that's the reason why um, Park Service called us in the first place, is they, they feel like a lot of these decisions are just sort of happening. And, and there maybe is a, a greater role for public involvement. Um, and then I'll, I'll just, um, the, there's a three-person committee that makes the decisions. That committee has not yet been uh, appointed, as far as I can tell. If someone said, poor guy, yeah. But be nice. I mean, be nice to him. Um, and uh, so just really quick, uh, anyone here know Adventure Cycling Association? OK, so they, they do bicycle tours. They're really great. They have a, a great trail um, initiatives coordinator named uh, Jenny Sullivan. And she um, lives in Missoula and um, applied for uh, a FLAP uh, grant. And her story, I think, is really instructive. Um, so again, the Western lands are the ones that had really moved really quickly on this, because there's a, there's a big focus on them. Um, I, think, I actually think that coordinator would be happy that people were paying attention to his program. Um, so Missoula had had a pro uh, project for a long time connecting its town to a, a, a town a few miles away called Lolo, Lola, Lolo. Um, and it had been in the works for a long time. So she described it as a dream for 25 years. They had already done a feasibility st study. They had already had their stakeholders lined up. They got letters from um, their, congr their US congressional uh, delegation supporting it, and the project was ready to go. Um, and so they, um, I mentioned the uh, letters from Congress, letters of support from the community. Um, and one of the things that, one of the lessons there was, you know, this is the kind of corridor they wanted to build it through, uh, it's parallel to a road. They had an ideal route that would be more direct and more level for cyclists. There were some challenges with the engineering for that route. And so instead of just saying it's our way or no way, they worked uh, with the engineers to figure out a route that would be uh, uh, more practical. Um, and so one of her suggestions is just to, is to be really flexible and make, and, and make some compromises to, to get your project done and then be prepared. So have, the, have it in the plans. Have the feasibility study ready. Now, um, unfortunately, this, this um, story uh, has a slightly unhappy ending is they weren't able to get the flat money for it. The reason for that is they defined economic generator as a project that would increase like um, tolls and entrance fees, so actually generate income for uh, the park itself rather than uh, generate economic activity, which we all know bike trails are really good for. So that was sort of this dispute. Um, and they, they challenged it, and they petitioned it, and, and um, 
They didn't win uh, that, but now they're tr applying for Tiger funds. And so we've been writing letters of support, and we're optimistic that with all the groundwork that they laid, they're going to make this trail um, successful. But again, I think the, the lessons that they learned, uh, sometimes failing can be as, as, a, a, as instructive as, as winning. And so um, laying all that groundwork uh, is, is good for any, whatever money you're going after. And then you have that ready for the next pot, the next opportunity. So uh, that's flat. This is the, the contact information there. <laughs> He'll be okay. Um, so I just wanted to quickly um, sort of summarize. There's a lot of information here. I just want to talk a little bit about um, the general suggestions. And so on, on the, the left-hand side, um, I have some sort of systematic suggestions, those policies and approaches that have worked well for folks. And then on the right-hand side, some recommendations for what individuals who have individual projects that they want to get funded should be thinking about. So, you know, just for, this goes for both the uh, agency staff and the um, advocates in the room, just building those relationships. No, having the connections with the folks that know when things are happening is really important. Know when the opportunities for public input um, are happening is really critically important. So just having those good relationships, that information flow is huge. And then the political support. So if you want to make a policy change, knowing that you have the support of the mayors who you know, are on the, um, the, the policy board uh, of the entity you're, you're talking about is really, really important. Um, and so just building up uh, community support for bicycling and walking is really part of that. Um, and then getting a seat at the table or tables, figuring out who is making the decision, and that's what we'll hear from next, um, and being part of that conversation. So having an official role, if possible, or an advisory role. Uh, helping to write, helping to make sure the applications are good and that the, the way that the prioritization happens is, is good. And um, sounds like there already is a pretty robust uh, prioritization system in place, which is great. <clears throat> And so if you're an individual with a project, what are some of the lessons? And, and the first one is make sure it's on a plan somewhere. If it's not on a plan, it, it's not going to be eligible and it's not going to be ready. Generate good projects. right? Figure out what the uh, criteria are and uh, align your project uh, with that. Sometimes you know, making those adjustments to make sure that it's going to fit uh, the priorities of the funding source and the funders. Again, knowing that timeline, really important. Uh, we, we heard from John that the, that the TAP funds are already committed for 2014. Um, so what are some of the other timelines uh, for the other programs? And how can we make sure that we're ready for the next time the, the opportunity comes around? Um, and then one, again, we hear, we hear a lot that um, the project sponsors aren't necessarily right. So that's those eligible entities, the cities, um, and so forth. That, they're excited for the money, but they need to really understand what the whole process entails. And it, and it is, uh, can be challenging with the, with the amount of, um, of red tape to use federal dollars. So all of us in the room can sort of make sure that our project sponsors have the capacity, uh, have the understanding of, what, of what's required. And that really also means that the federal, the local match too. So do you, do you have a local funding source um, ready to match with those federal dollars, and that can really open the doors up. So, those are some of the um, so overall observations and suggestions. Uh, any questions on on all that? And then we'll hear from the local. Just a comment regarding that last piece. Um, Hampton Roads is closed to a lot of cities, and mm -hmm. so there are a lot of um, local people with VDOT as projects. And one of the things VDOT is really keen on is um, the project sponsors. Um, going through the federal process smoothly and quickly, you know, getting the project completed and getting the money um, through the cycle and closing it out. And the quicker you do that, I think the better beat out will work. Yeah, so what would you suggest? I mean, that's, that's a great point, and it's something we hear a lot. What, if I'm a potential, I work for a city and I want to apply and I want to work well with VDOT, what do, what do I do? I mean, I think it's the same thing you have. But the better planned out you are, the better study or some preliminary look, a lot of times projects just come out of 
nowhere, somebody has an idea, but it's not really fleshed out, you know, and someone agrees to program X amount of dollars on a project, but then it just sits there because it's got this backlog of doing the design and planning and then right away issues. I mean, some things always come up, but the, the more the projects are vetted on the front end, the quicker they can move through the process. Great, thank you. And I would echo that for the recreational trails program because uh, you know the relationship you build with our grant administrator means that you'll be able to come back for grants in the future. And so try to make sure you've done the planning up front that you've really seriously looked at the environmental questions and that you you know that you own the property or control the property that you're going to be building your project on, or else you have agreements in writing. And I think we're going to have a little time uh, this afternoon to talk about this exact question of what advocates can do to work with agency staff and, and sort of make the whole process go really smoothly and support each other politically and on all those things. So uh, keep, keep, that, keep thinking in terms of those, those terms, how to, how to um, get from project idea to, to trail, because that's really what we want to do. We, we, we want to make sure that we get the money, but then we also get the stuff built that implementation piece on that planning slide. Um, so thank you for, for that. Uh, any other questions? I think we're right on time. Um, so yeah, I'm going to ask Rita to come up. And then, um, so at noon, we will be breaking for lunch. So um, hang in there. Yeah, um, right is next. And then if you want to point, that's the, that's the pointer. Do you want, do you want this? Okay. All right, so now we can answer all those, how does it really work here? Okay, so the next few slides we're going to talk about how this is, how these funding streams work in Hampton Roads. And I have Mike Kimbrell here, he's the expert to, to speak on all these programs, and I volunteered him to answer the tough questions, so direct all questions there. But just to give you a brief introduction, we've all heard about the TPO, so we are one of the MPOs in the state of Virginia, and on our policy board, and two of the mayors talked earlier, so we have a lot of members from our localities, public transit, federal, state, and other stakeholders. So what have we done for active transportation planning? So traditionally, the planning for active transportation happens at the local level. But in the last few years, we've seen a lot more regional coordination, uh, localities working together, and it's become an important uh, priority for us. And I think partly this has to do with the fact that a lot of the support for these facilities has increased steadily. Um, last. December, we did a visioning survey for our long-range transportation plan, and we asked the public, what do you want, where do you want your tax dollars to be uh, spent? Bike and pet facilities came right on top, and uh, that just confirmed to us that this is very important to the public, and this is something we should focus our efforts on. So what have we done? Some of them are ongoing, some we've completed. So the first thing we did last year was we looked at a scan of best practices. And I think some, a copy of this document is around outside. It's available on our website. And if you guys need a copy or want to get the PDF, let me know and I can send it to you. Uh, the second thing we're doing is uh, we're working with VDOT and VDOT staff who have helped us are right in the back. And for those of you who have time, I would recommend that you go look at the draft bike pit inventory that's on the wall right there. And what we're trying to do is come up with a consistent classification of facilities. Uh, each locality has a way of classifying them, but at the regional level, we thought it's important a bike lane that's called bike lane in Norfolk remains the same in Virginia Beach and vice versa. So, we're working on it right now, it's still in draft, and I'd like to take a moment to thank the VDOT staff, Mitzi and Angela and Carl, who's not here. They've been very helpful in helping us come up with this. So thank you, and if you could provide comments or review it, we'd really appreciate it. The third thing that we're doing is we're kind of laying the groundwork. Um, bike pit planning is a priority in our work program. 
So we're collecting all relevant data, like where people are using these facilities. Uh, one of the maps that Darren showed talked about fatalities. And one of our uh, staff here is working on crash data, and he was able to give us uh, crash data for 2009 to 12 for bike and pedestrian, which we think we could use going forward, like, okay, where are these problems happening, and what can we do? So it's a lot of collecting the information, but we hope we, our long-term vision is to see a regional active transportation plan, but making sure we have the data to support this as we move forward. So coming to the funding streams, which is what Darren had touched on earlier. So the first one is the Transportation Alternatives Program, and VDOT administers it, and we work with VDOT on them. Uh, second stream is the Surface Transportation Program, and uh, Mike is in charge of the regional component of the Surface Transportation Program, along with the CMAC. Um, in Virginia, the VDOT takes care of the Highway Safety Improvement Program, and uh, for Section 402 grants, we have the Department of Motor Vehicles that kind of oversees this program. So for the Transportation Alternatives Program, I think there were a couple of questions on how we handle the MPO portion of it. Um, Mike might answer more, but the, the way we were, we've been uh, explained is the VDOT Local Assistant Division kind of oversees the program, and they develop the policy and the selection criteria working with all the MPOs. So to streamline the process, anyone applying for this has only one call for applications. They just fill out one application. So for Hampton Roads, you don't have to fill out a state application or an MPO, you just fill out one. And we think this makes best use of our resources and this gives us a very good opportunity to work with the VDOT uh, local assistant division staff. And so far, it seems to be working well. So coming to the dates, for the next uh, TAP program, most of you must have received an email yesterday, I think, that went out on a workshop to review the program guidelines. Um, LAD is holding all these workshops all across the state, and I think the one closest to our region is in Smithfield on August 13th. I think I, got, I, think I saw the email yesterday, so if you haven't received it, I could forward it to you. So LAD is going to talk about how they're going to review projects, what are the criteria, what's the selection process. And as, a, as an MPO, we have requested the localities that are looking to use or apply for these funds, send us a letter asking for endorsement. And then the deadline is November 1, 2013. So it's really important that you attend these workshops just to get a good idea of how this program works. So for the last year, which we talked about earlier, we had five projects. And if you see, the reason I have both the CTB and the TPO allocations is to show you the way we have funded it. So we try to make sure a project gets, you know, if it's not funded by the state, we can help, you know, put in the remaining. Uh, so the first project in Chesapeake, it was the TPO that funded it, whereas the project in Virginia Beach came, the funding came from the state. So we want to make sure that we're making the best use of the TAP funds and we're not duplicating efforts, but rather supplementing them. So I think having this one application, making sure the process is streamlined, it's worked well, and LAD has been very helpful and worked with us quite closely. So, so far it's working, and this is what we have. So in terms of CMAC and RSTP, I'm going to talk about them together because there's a lot of overlap in the way we do it. Um, there is a policy which the board said, but uh, Mike's team, and I think it's been a very robust process, and all the information in terms of criteria, the selection, how we score the projects, all of that is available on our website. And uh, we developed it as part of the TPO staff developed it, and of course, our board and our technical committees have to approve it. Uh, you might see a lot of acronyms in this presentation, and I apologize, but the local funding template that's in your handout, there's a lot more information. So if you stop me if I'm using a lot of acronyms, but for example, TTAC is our Transportation Technical Advisory Committee, and the TPO is our policy board. So if, you, if, you're, not, if you're confused, just stop me, but the handout should have all this information. So there's a lot of information here, and I'm gonna to try to explain it, but this is how 
the selection process has worked, and this has been developed over many years. And uh, the first thing is in July, we kind of look at is there funds, can we open it up for projects? And if they do, we put it out on our website. We ask the public to submit any project suggestions that they might have. We forward it to the localities and also open it up for eligible recipients to submit applications. And that typically happens around July through mid-August. And then using our selection criteria, which is available on our website, our staff go through each of these projects, analyze them, and rank them. And that happens around September. And now we work with another committee called the Transportation Programming Subcommittee. So what we do is we sit down with them, go through each of our analysis, and then review each of these projects and make sure, OK, we are all comfortable with how this is done. And once that happens, they, they recommend, OK, these projects look good. Let's go with funding under CMAC and RSTP. Once that's done, we go back to our technical advisory committee. That happens around November and say, OK, this is what the programming subcommittee has recommended. And then they look at it and they say, yes, looks good, and finally adopted by the board. So the process starts all the way from July till the board adoption in November. So if you look at some of the highlights, so we've, all, we've used CMAC funds for a lot of our active transportation projects. So if you look at the range from, Mike gave me the stats from 1993 to 2018, we would have used these funds to, for 44 active transportation projects. And in terms of the percentage, it's 14% of our CMAC funds. If you look at, in terms of dollars, it's 8% of our CMAC fund allocations. So just a brief stop here. And a lot of all these projects, whether they're funded by TAP or CMAC, they get included in our transportation improvement program. And all of you should have received a table that shows all the projects. And just to note, these are only projects that are standalone bike and pet projects. So if you have a large construction project and a bike lane is being built as part of this construction project, that will not be included in that table. Of course, we could include it, but we wanted to highlight um, the projects that have a very specific active transportation focus. So that comes to about 34 projects. and. In that table, there's more detail. And I think Ken had that, bro that document. If you want more details, we also have a one-page summary that shows details on each of these projects. I could email you the PDF uh, if, after the workshop, but let us know if you need a copy. Can, I'll be happy to get that to you. OK, so now coming to the VDOT Highway Safety Improvement Program. The next two programs I'm going to talk about is being administered by VDOT, so we don't have much of a role on these programs. Uh, Stephen Reed is the person from VDOT that I talked to about this program, and I have his contact information in the last sheet. Um, so they asked me to let you know that this program is currently being revised because of MAP21, so they changes. So talking to them, they said, please monitor our website. There could be changes because of MAP21. So traditionally, they had three programs under the HSIP, and bike and pedestrian safety was one of them. And how do they select their project selection criteria? It is determined by the central office uh, HSIP, HSIP staff. And once they decide, it has to be approved by the Commonwealth Transportation Board. And in terms of timeline, they didn't have a specific, they had a general timeline, so they said usually in the fall to winter, we review projects, we receive submissions, and this always helped. They try to do it before the six-year six -year improvement program update, and the Commonwealth Transportation Board approves a project list in the spring. So I think Darren went over some of the criteria, but when I looked at the proposal form that I found online, the focus seems to be more about what is, your pro what is the problem? Why do you think there is a problem? And why is this project going to solve this problem? So if it is just like, OK, I want to see if this will work, it doesn't, you're not going to get a good grant. It's more like, OK, here is a safety problem. This is how this project is going to solve that. So they were very clear about that being important. And also, they talked about 
the effectiveness and the readiness of the project. Uh, so it's, uh, it's more ready to go. You have all the background laid out. This funding is going to help it move forward. That's the kind of project they're looking for. And then, of course, they want local matcher support. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, there could be slight changes in these policies and guidelines because of MAP21. Uh, so please monitor their website in case you want to make sure you have the latest information. Um, so when I asked for how much have they spent, they said between uh, 07 to 13, total allocations to bike pedestrian safety projects was about 10%. And of course, there's a website here where you can get more information on the program. So the last uh, uh, funding stream I'm going to talk about is Section 402. So this is administered by the Virginia Highway Safety Office, which is with the Department of Motor Vehicles. And again, their selection committee is made up of their staff who have expertise in specific program areas. Um, then they have a committee of the upper management, and they work together, and then they advise the commissioner and secretary of transportation. So like the HSIP program, there are various funding areas. So bike and ped is one of the seven or eight funding areas under Section 402. So right there. So that's the program. But as Darren mentioned, private nonprofits, academic institutions, they're all eligible to apply for Section 402 grants. So when I went through the selection criteria, Again, like the HSIP, it was more of an impact. So what is the problem? How is this going to solve it? How have you performed on previous grants? So again, that's where the relationship and your performance, and how, as uh, John had mentioned, if your project, if you made good project, uh, progress on a previous project, there is more of that, OK. So there's that confidence and that relationship that you have. And of course, you also know, need to point out that what is the value? You know, you're not, if you're getting, if you're spending million dollars to bring about a reduction of one fatality, then they're not going to fund it. It's more the cost effectiveness and what can you get for your money. So that's very important. And like the HSIP, there is a funding requirement here. So the re in this I, the slide, I'm talking about the timeline. And the reason I say typical is when I talked to DMB, they said things are changing because of MAP21, but this is what they typically use. So in December, they usually announce for a workshop. The, this is a grant writing workshop announcement. And the workshops are actually held in Jan. The reason that's important is to even apply for this program, you have to attend the workshop. So don't miss out on those workshops because you cannot apply. They, when I talked to DMV, they were very clear that we need to let you all know that that's important. And then the grant applications are due in February. And then in July is when the decisions are announced. Uh, the DMV person told me that this is typical. This is what they think they will go with even under MAP21. But check with the DMV person or check their website before you start applying for projects. And uh, another important thing is, as I pointed out, there are more funding areas, like seven or eight. And bike and pedestrian safety projects, they do not have a separate funding. And what they wanted me to insist was a well-written grant is very important. Focus on the impacts and how and why this project is going to help the situation. And again, that's the website of the DMV. And I had also have some handouts on the 2013 um, program, which has details on eligibility, funding, and I think they're out there, so grab it. Or if you don't find it, or don't get a copy, let me know, and I can send it out to you. So that's pretty. Oh, do you have a question? Well, I think the are excellent. If we email you, can you? I think, the, yeah, they'll be posted so on. Yeah, it's, it's all one presentation. So, so they will be posted on the website. Can't say tomorrow, next week. <laughs> <laughs> Whose website? Oh, we'll, we actually email it out. Oh, if you're on the registration list. And we could host them on our website, too. So, Wayne, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I keep seeing the word grant up here, but it's not associated with each of the programs. Uh, you know, so some of them are competitively obtained funds. Mm -hmm. 
and some of them are not. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak a little bit to how we, as you know, people who have projects and want to get done, mm -hmm. can get into the, the funding stream for those non-competitively obtained? Which ones are you talking about? Uh, well, you'd have to go back to one of the previous slides. I have no idea which one. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like parts of, uh, well, the STP. Uh -huh. uh, it seems like that's what I call just managed funds. Mm -hmm. Um, how can we, what, what's our process for actually getting into the money? Uh, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. For the regionals, uh, the RSTP funds, we go through a process, right, where we evaluate the projects? Yeah, and regional the STP is a competitive program. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about the state's STP fund, but I'd say pretty much any funding source is a competitive program. You know, there's so, such scarce transportation funds, they're going to have to go back to the base for why we all get to get funding. I treat just about any program you go for as a competitive program. Put together a good package, clearly explaining what you're trying to do, and uh, include maps and nature or whatever. But yeah, the regional STP is certainly a competitive program. And, and that information is on our website, and it's on these slides as well, so you can. Okay, so here in this, uh, a lot of this information is there in that template that we provided, but I just wanted to highlight the people, important contacts. Some of them are here, Mike's here, John's here, and Mitzi is here for Eric from the VDOT uh, Hampton Roads District. Uh, so definitely contact them, make sure you talk to them and get all the information. For example, the DMV, I got a lot of the information just, by, just because I called them, the information wasn't readily available on the website. So. Uh, they pointed me to Monty Mills, who's the, uh, whose focus is bike and pedestrian safety. Uh, and I think Dwight Jenkins, whose information is on the template, is the Portsmouth uh, uh, coordinator. So make sure you know the persons, and this should give you a start, and some of the information is available on the funding template. So. But that's pretty much what we have from the Hampton Roads portion, and I could take any questions. Yes. As far as I reviewed it, it didn't look like you were prevented from applying. Like, you could. But what they were trying to just tell me was make sure they, whatever you do, you, you understand it's a very competitive process and just have, use the funds wisely. And make sure you apply. Well, in, in other words, if, if you're applying to two different places, you know, two different grants with one grant board look and say, oh, well, they're asking money from somebody else. I don't believe so. For example, under TAP, we kind of look at a project and make sure that if it isn't being funded under state, okay, we can help them, or if there's a balance, we can. That's what we do under TAP. Uh, but for DMV and the HSIP, I haven't been able to get that information. And I don't think it decreases your chances, but you might want to check. So I don't want to reduce you. They said December is when the announcement goes out. So you might want to contact Monty Mills, who's the bike and pedestrian. His, so in DMV, there are various um, focus areas, and each person has a specialty. Um, John was the one who put me in touch with the head, and she said, well, Monty Mills is the bike and pedestrian safety person. But December is when they said the announcement for the workshop goes out. Yes? I just wanted to readdress my earlier question. I guess Mike would be the one to answer this. Where does Hampton Roads currently stand as far as losing our non-attainment or maintenance maintenance status for CMAC? Yeah, we're, we haven't been able to figure that out yet. Uh, the, the region is in attainment for the new 2008, new 2008. <laughs> <laughs> finally, 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 we're a maintenance area for the 1997 standard, which has just been rescinded. So we are efficient entertainment area, which, which that, that means you're not eligible for CMAC funds. So we've been coordinating with VDOT trying to find out what exactly that means, because we've got CMAC funds programmed out through 2018 right now. So we need to know if we get those. Uh, 
There's some language in the regulations that indicate that if, if the state doesn't uh, need as much CMAQ funding as it did before, then it might be getting more RSVP funding instead. So we're trying to find out does it mean that we'll get a bigger part of RSVP funding then instead. We don't have those answers yet. Uh, we just started, I, I sent messages to BDOT a couple months ago trying to you know, start getting those answers and they're still working. We'll try to keep everyone apprised of, of what we learned with that. As it turns out right now, the CMAC and RSDP funding has been decreasing in the last couple of years. We've had to actually go back and anybody, students, several people that uh, work with this know that we've had to go back and actually deallocate funds for the project because the, uh, the funding that they thought would be available has been decreasing. So that's why we haven't even had a project selection process in the last couple of years because there's no, not any funding available to do. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll try to keep people advised. If you're, uh, we work with our transportation technical committee, so if you're in a locality or something, uh, you know, get to know that person. If one of the people that sits on our TTAC. Yeah, I work on the market. Okay, so so he can keep you up to date with where we are on, on finding out those answers.
control the sunlight, but we can try to look for projects that can reduce VOCs and NOx. So we go through and we, we see how many tons per year of VOCs the project is supposed to reduce. And then we look at how many tons per year of NOx the project is you know, estimated to reduce. And we, we divide the, the cost of the project by that reduction, and we sort those from least cost and most cost for VOC, I mean for VOC, and least cost and most cost for NOx. We number them sequentially from least cost and most cost, and then we add up the two numbers and get a composite score. And so something might do great on the VOCs and maybe not so much on NOx, so some other projects might be great on both. We want to place great on both if it's, as long as the cost is not exorbitant, we'll score better. So what, at the end, you're looking at bang for the buck, uh, cost or for improving emissions. And whether it's a bike project or an intersection project or, uh, or whatever, we're able to compare those projects directly against each other that way. So what you're looking for with a bike project is something that's going to take a good number of vehicles off the road because that's where you're going to get your emissions reduction. And if, you know, if it's a cost-effective project as well, then it would probably score pretty well. We, we have some right now in the, the perceived recent CMAC funding uh, because they scored well that way. Uh, you know, when, I, when we look at uh, roadway projects, things like redoing signal time score as well because it doesn't cost very much to go out and redo time to signal. Whereas if you want to add left turn lane, that's a lot more expensive, so that's not going to score as well. And if you want to totally redo the intersection, it's probably going to be at the bottom of the list because it's just so expensive to do. So think in terms of showing how the project's going to reduce emissions and, uh, and try to keep those costs in check and it'll probably score pretty well. Uh, now, we have improved methodology on how we look at these things. If it's a, a bike project, uh, there's a certain distance. And we're, look, we're really looking at mainly projects that will, uh, will help communicate. You know, we're talking about taking cars off the road. It's not going to re really be so much a bike path through a park, you know, because that's not going to take a lot of vehicles off the road. In fact, a lot of people will drive to the park and then take their bikes off the car. You know? So what we need to do is find projects to take cars off the road. That's how we reduce emissions. Uh, we, and our analysis takes into account the distance people are usually willing to ride their bikes, either to, to catch a transit bus or to, to get to work or shopping or whatever. If it's walking, that's a, that's a smaller area, I mean, a smaller distance people are willing to walk. So we look at those things and then we uh, you know, just kind of compute what the emissions reduction is going to be. Those the emission, the emission reduction numbers come from whatever the current uh, EPA mobile source emissions model is. And I think right now it's moves 2010. And so we get the emissions factors from that. So we're using kind of consistent emission factors for where the time Does that kind of answer? Very good. Thank you. Perfect. Mike, I have a quick question for you. Um, uh, on the question of things being programmed out for, for years, what we found other places is a lot of times there's annual or uh, frequent uh, tip amendments sort of moving around the commitment. So you may be committed out with a certain set of projects now that may move around a little bit and change. Does that, does that happen in your experience here? Uh, well, sometimes we'll have a locality that's got a couple of CMAX projects. And for whatever reason, one of them might not be progressing with the way they thought it would. And they've got another one that needs money. Or maybe one just isn't going to be able to go. And, and the cost has increased on another CMAX project. We do have requests to be able to transfer uh, CMAX funding from one approved project to another that way. Uh, the, the trouble is there's no room really to get a new project in there because we have so many projects already approved. It doesn't really make sense to add new projects when you have these other ones that still are in the works and they need more funding. You know, so we want to make sure that we actually get the new projects. And so you know, we're not really, we don't allow you to go in and keep on adding new stuff whenever we still need to pay for these other ones that aren't fully funded yet. So yeah, you know, we, uh, the way to get a project in there is really to get it into one of those out years and, and it's going to stay on schedule. I, you know, we, sometimes we end up with a project that gets canceled for some reason and frees up some money. Uh, but normally there's so many, 
So the projects that were already in the queue, <coughs> that rather than add a new project, what you're going to do is go in and find one of the projects that's already been approved. Maybe you can move this schedule upside. You know, maybe you got funded out in 2017 because somebody dropped a project that had some funding available. Maybe you can move that one back and start it in 2016 or 2015. But you know, you're less likely to add a brand new one and, and move ahead of all these other ones that have already been in the works. But I guess it's better in 2013 to get something programmed into 2018 than to wait till 2018 and have to wait till 2023. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever the, whatever the project selection process opens up, uh, go ahead and get a project in there for whatever funding is available. And then if you have a project in, it's already going to be. On this entire matter of scheduling and funds being allocated out to 2019, you said, we just heard about a new program, I believe it was SLAP. Do you know what the status of funding and how far allocated that is? Do you have anything to do with it? I don't have any information on SLAP. We just heard. SLAP. SLAP. I don't have any information on SLAP I don't think it's an NPO, uh, you know, something that the NPO is in charge of. Well, um, I want to thank Mike and, and thank you so much for a great presentation. I mean, all the details you could you could want to, to understand these programs are in those slides. So we'll definitely get them out. And thank you so much for a really thorough job. Really quick, if you're on this list, can you raise your hand real quick? I know John's here. Who, who else is in the room who's on this list? Mike. I just I see two hands. OK. Well, anyway, thank you for coming, you guys. Um, and so with that, um, actually, round of applause for you guys. Thank you so much. It's time for lunch. Um, so it is out in the hall. And is there, a, I think it's just um, packed lunches. Let's see. Yeah, so they're box lunches. Uh, there may be a few vegetarian or gluten-free or other dietary things. So if you're not, if you didn't request one of those, please you know, stick with uh, the others. Um, and we will be back here, um, what, what is the, at one o'clock. So, uh, enjoy. Yeah, the two hours in charge.